Okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, new video where we are going to discuss some stuff uh, on the board. Now, uh, today what we are going to discuss is uh, related to some of the things we've seen in the previous video, and I'm going to, to tell a bit how that works. Uh, essentially, we are going to see how surface elements um, can be inherited uh, from an embedding, um, and then we are going to apply that to a sphere that we embed in 3D, uh, in R3. Um, and then we are going to see how that leads to some uh, kind of unintuitive conclusions when it comes to a uniform sampling uh, on a point on a sphere. Okay, so that's quite a, a lot of stuff to, to look at, uh, but uh, hopefully we will get there. Okay, so first let's talk about uh, inheritance. So in a previous video, we've seen how uh, once you have a curve that is embedded in R2, and R2 is itself endowed with the Euclidean uh, metric, then this is going to impose a metric, so you don't have any freedom for it, uh, uh, on the curve that you embed within uh, R2. Okay, so that's that was called inheritance of, of the metric. Uh, now it turns out that uh, if you are in R3 and you embed a surface in there, then of course you can imagine uh, also curves, but if you imagine a surface, then this is going to, um, and, and, and R3 itself is endowed with, again, Euclidean metric, uh, so Euclidean geometry, and also notions of volume, which is that the volume, um, let's say, of a cuboid is simply uh, the, the multiplication, the direct multiplication of the height, depth, and, um, and length, then you're going to, to get like the traditional Euclidean geometry that everybody talks about. So if you start from there, then you can have a surface that inherits and that has basically imposed on it uh, how the surface area element is going to look like. Um, and so that's what we are going to, to look at here. So essentially, we need to imagine that we've got uh, R3 that is endowed with a Euclidean metric. And the Euclidean metric here simply says that you've got uh, ds e is equal to dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. So that's the so-called generalized uh, Pythagoras theorem. Okay, so that, that's, what, uh, that's what we have. And uh, then we also have, so that's one of the things here, and then we also have that the so-called volume form is a traditional uh, volume form. Uh, which is uh, dx, dy, dz, uh, where here we need to imagine uh, a cuboid, like so. Where we've got here dx, dy, and dz. Okay, so once we have this, this, uh, these two features, then what we need to do is, okay, how do we actually characterize a surface and then the element of surface as well. So the way we do that is, uh, as well, uh, I think I've messed up a bit the, the camera, so let's do that like this. Maybe you will see a bit better. Um, so the way we do this is that we say that uh, surface sigma is characterized by the equation. And here's the equation that I've chosen is of the form f x y z is equal to some constant. It's very similar to what we had seen with curves uh, earlier. So uh, earlier in a previous video. So so that's kind of the idea. And essentially, what it says is that you 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 it, it does seem that there are three independent variables, but actually they are connected together because you've got uh, this function of this of these variables that is equal to a constant. So essentially one of them is redundant in that sense. Um, okay, so once we have that, then the way we write it here, and we need to be a, a bit uh, a bit careful uh, in the way we do things. We need to be a bit careful. Um, Uh, 
because some prefactors can come in and so on. So we need to be slightly careful in what we uh, in what we ask. Uh, but essentially here, what I'm going to say is that uh, so when you define this function here, you need to be slightly careful, and I'm going to, to, to we are going to see that a bit later. Um, so here uh, we say that the surface um, element uh, integral is uh, like so. So I'm calling d a sigma the area element the surface sigma characterized by that function and the way i'm going to uh, so the integral is over the entirety of sigma and then the way i'm going to write this is basically i write this integral it's going to be a volume integral over the entirety um, of uh, r3 and then i'm going to have the dirac delta of f x y z minus constant and then dv okay so that's and that thing is a definition so essentially when i'm performing this particular integral i'm going to have naturally some uh, uh, some variables or whatever that are going to correspond to sigma in some shape or form okay um, and therefore i can there once i do that i can perform this integral and identify the variables corresponding to sigma and so on in fact, that's what we are going to see right now uh, with the case of the sphere. So in the case of the sphere, we've got uh, a sphere embedded uh, in R3. So it's already, uh, it's already said, so that's fine. Let's not uh, waste time. So the equation is going to be like this. The equation I'm, I'm providing for the sphere is R, um, not R. In fact, uh, do it this way. So we've got uh, f of x, y, z is equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared. I take the square root of it and I say this is equal to r. Okay? So here, the reason why this is useful is because I'm specifying that the square root of that quantity so basically the you know if you take the square root of um, yeah so i'm taking the square root of that quantity um, now the thing is that if you if i had written the thing with squares so x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to r squared then i would have to take into account the fact that there are two possibilities that can happen is that plus square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to r or minus square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to r and so this would actually affect the the, the kind of area i would get uh, with this factor two there because there is a plus or minus okay uh, while here i'm i'm basically saying no I, I know what i'm talking about i'm talking about the euclidean distance in 3d and i want this to be equal to r okay so otherwise this would this would lead to uh, to some prefactors that need to be interpreted uh, and then corrected. Okay, so here we I do it ahead of time, if you will, with this expression here. So then, what we want to find is, is this quantity uh, here. So I'm going to write uh, the integral sigma. I haven't specified how the integrals of a sigma uh, look like yet, but we are going to do it afterwards. Um, so this is going to be equal to the integral uh, of a R three. Um, yeah, sorry, you probably have seen that. <laughs> uh, so then we've got uh, delta, and then x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and then minus r, and then we've got dx, dy, dz. And in principle, you can, you know, if you know how to, that this thing, by the way, is a Dirac delta. So this delta here is a Dirac delta. Okay, and uh, I'm going to use like the simplest property of the Dirac delta uh, in this calculation. Okay, so that's why uh, I want to express things as simply as possible. Um, so that's what I have, and now of course what I realize is that um, um, it's easier to switch uh, to co to spherical coordinates. So uh, uh, spherical coordinates.
and the spherical coordinates are called r theta phi they are defined by the following relation so x is equal to r or let's say cos phi sine theta y is equal to r sine phi sine theta and z is equal to r cosine theta okay and the way you actually represent this graphically is that you've got a sphere then you've got x y and then z here then you take from the origin a point that has uh, that is at a distance r from that from uh, the origin um, and then you project so first of all the angle between the z-axis and this particular uh, vector is theta then you project onto uh, the xy plane and the you know shadow of uh, of this of this vector onto the xy plane as an angle phi uh, with the um, x-axis so that's how you could uh, represent uh, this if you if you want to now the thing is that the dv in this particular uh, um, coordinate system uh, is equal to r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi that's how the volume element looks like in this uh, in this particular thing and it's very easy to retrieve by using the jacobian method now i'm not actually um, going to derive that today but i will do that in a further video on how we get this kind of different things uh, by using jacobian transformations that works very well the jacobian transformations when looking at volume so-called volume forms but that doesn't work as well when when actually looking at surfaces okay so that's why we need to use this contrived way of doing things um, okay so um, that's how that works so essentially uh, what uh, by the way one of the things that works you, you can check for yourself if you do x squared plus y squared plus z squared is going to be equal to the lowercase r squared okay so that's why i'm using this uh, here now what we are going to see is that the integral da uh, sigma here is going to be the integral and then from theta equals 0 to pi and then phi equals 0 to 2 pi and then integral uh, r equals 0 to plus infinity um, then i've got delta of r minus r and then i've got r squared sine theta d theta d phi but it turns out that what the delta does is uh, basically simply cancelling out, if you will, the integral of R and substituting capital R uh, in, t in, in place of the uh, lowercase uh, R here. So the final equation you get here is going to be the integral theta from 0 to pi and phi from 0 to 2 pi. And then you're going to get R squared sine theta d theta d phi now it turns out that if you look at what phi and theta are doing the only thing they do is actually sampling the surface of the sphere uh, nothing else so uh, if you want to probe simply the surface r is fixed anyway then you're just going to vary theta and phi and you're going to get uh, all the possible points uh, on the sphere okay so theta and phi essentially screen uh, through uh, all possible uh, points on the sphere. Okay, so that's kind of um, the idea. Um, but then what we see is that um, there is a sine theta here. That, so there is a function of theta uh, that, that, that matters there. And so what I mean by that is that the integral sigma here can be interpreted as being this thing so the integral and the variables are this here so this thing is the integral of a sigma so over the surface of the sphere um, and then i can interpret this part here as being because the integration of a, a of a, this delta has been already performed uh, as being da sigma okay so that's basically how that, that would work. Um, so I sample again 
all points on the sphere with these two variables. However, the surface element itself actually contains uh, this R squared and this sine theta. Okay, so now we, we can go to discussing uh, probabilities on the uniform, uh, sorry, uniform probability on the sphere. So uniform. So let's say I've got uh, probability density. Probability density. Rho on the sphere. So rho of r. And by definition, what that means is that uh, rho of r is equal to rho is equal to a constant on the sphere. And I define, so here there's the important part, I define the probability for any point to belong to a subset uh, sigma, so lowercase sigma of the sphere uppercase sigma. Uh, sorry, that's not, sorry, that's not, that's not a belonging to, that's an included in uh, symbol that I should do. So that's this. I define it as being the integral from rho on the subset sigma of dA sigma, okay? And so uh, in this particular case, um, you, you would have uh, that this is equal to rho. Um, and then here, the, you would have the area uh, of sigma, if you will, okay? Um, so that's the area of uh, sigma. Okay, so basically we, we're kind of uh, done here, I, I think. Um, I think we're mostly done because uh, what we are going to see is um, that uh, on top of it, because it's a probability, the probability to be uh, in sigma itself has to be one. And so what we are going to get is that this is still rho of a sigma. And so what we are going to get is the following. Rho is equal to 1 over a of sigma. So that's, again, a very standard thing that rho is 1 over the volume or surface element or whatever that you are looking at. Okay, So that, that's what we have. Now, the tricky bit is, first of all, we need to evaluate A of sigma. Now, of course, this is the area of a sphere, but let's do it with what we have uh, here. Um, so, first of all, A of sigma is equal to, uh, so let's put the R squared outside. If I want to integrate this quantity here, I notice that there is no dependence in phi. So I can just integrate directly phi, so from phi from 0 to 2 pi, I'm going to get r squared times 2 pi. And then I need to integrate the sine of theta. So the sine of theta is going to be um, minus cosine of theta. Okay, and then evaluate it from 0 to pi. Okay, now the if you evaluate that, that, that thing, uh, I can do it here. You're going to get that this is 4 pi times r squared. Okay, which is a standard result we should we should expect. Okay, um, so that's the total area. What that means is that therefore, uh, rho is equal to one divided by four pi r squared. Okay, and then uh, what I want to know is um, is basically what is therefore the probability for um, uh, for a point to belong in a in a slab of the sphere. Uh, or in a surf uh, surface element of the sphere that is between theta uh, and de theta plus uh, d, d theta and phi plus d phi. So then I can say, well, the probability for r, uh, so for the point r that is pointing from the origin to belong to uh, a set of angles. Um, uh, that corresponds to theta and, and theta plus uh, delta theta. So that's, um, so sigma of theta, theta plus delta theta, d theta, I would say d theta, 
let's not uh, be afraid of it uh, theta plus d theta but also phi phi plus d phi uh, so that's a long thing to write but that's basically what i want i want a surface element that is on the surface so uh, that is on the sphere the spheres of radius r so i need to take that into account so that's why i put r here and i put sigma there um, and then the angles are going to have values from theta to theta plus d theta and phi phi plus d phi now the actual outcome of this thing is simply going to be dA directly. Uh, so this thing is going to be dA sigma times rho. Um, and, and that's it, right? So that's, a, that's by definition the effect. The, the effect right? By definition. Is rho times dA. Um, and so dA, I know what it is. It's actually R squared. And so what I get is actually sine theta d theta d phi divided by 4 pi. So you see that the, the uh, r squared are going to cancel out because there is a row here. The row con contains a 1 over r squared. And then the dA here contains an r squared. So they cancel out. And you actually get the probability for uniformly sampling uh, a sphere, which is independent uh, of it. Uh, now where the the problem that most people have is that i'm not sure actually you can see let me uh, make sure that no you can't see the whole of it um so what people actually are confused about and that includes myself to be honest is that uh, initially you would expect that the uniformity entails that there is a constant value in front of d theta and d phi because d theta and d phi in principle characterize the entirety of the sphere so why is it that we actually have this extra factor sine theta and the problem has to do with the curvature really it has to do with some aspect associated to the curvature uh, um, and, and the geometry of the sphere so what happens is that if you take for example like the equator type of thing so let's say you take the bigger radius on the sphere uh, here okay and now just for the sake of it you take another uh, guy uh, here Okay, so that's supposed to be a circle. So you take basically a circle that is like a plane intersecting the sphere, either like on the largest basis or somewhere at a non-zero height. Then in that case, you will see that the, uh, the, the distance here, so the radius uh, that I'm going to call, I don't know how to call it, um, but this particular distance is going to be r sine theta. Okay? while the orange one is directly r just to give an example if you take the radius here that's basically going to be r um, uh, and that's because sine of pi over 2 is equal to, to 1 okay so the bottom line is that if you try for example to count let's say the number of points on that circumference um, is going to be um, is going to be smaller than the number of points on that circumference because as you know the circumference is simply larger okay so although you you have the same value of phi when you are here and there actually the number of points covered uh, is less by an amount sine theta okay so that's basically what, what happens uh, why there is this sine theta and it has to do with the geometry of it it has to do with the fact that basically the sphere is comprising uh, of uh, circles that are basically piled or stacked together and become smaller and smaller uh, in radius. Um, so that's kind of the idea, uh, and that's where the sine theta comes from. Uh, now, of course, you could imagine uh, a case where you sample the sphere in terms of theta and phi uniformly on the product, uh, Cartesian product of theta and phi. Uh, you could do that, but that would not correspond to the kind of uh, embedding situation we've looked at where everything stems from this uh, inheritance of the surface measure for this particular um, uh, aspect. If we were to define directly on the sphere intrinsically uh, a surface element, we could, uh, but that wouldn't be the same as what we do when we uh, work with this inheritance principle uh, of getting a surface area from, um, as, we, as discussed here, from basically the embedding and the geometric properties of the embedding, embedding space okay 
So I hope at least it's a bit clearer if some of you were confused about why there is this sine theta for a uniform sampling on a sphere, then it's basically that the circumference is smaller as you go higher here. And in fact, the, the, you know, if you go to the pole, then nothing happens there. Okay, so there is no point uh, to sample in a sense. Um, so, you, so again, that, that's quite fascinating because the phi value for any pi, the phi value can vary from, from any theta value. The phi value varies from 0 to 2 pi, but then the actual number of points on the sphere, because of the geometric aspect of it, uh, is, is, is varying by an amount sine theta. So I hope uh, it was a bit dense. Uh, I hope uh, it was uh, still useful. Uh, if you've got any questions, please let me know. And I will also uh, actually do uh, a video on, on Jacobian transformations uh, for volume elements because it is very useful.